Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des TF Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver In a historic repudiation of the Trump administration, the Senate voted today to end U.S. support for the Saudi war in Yemen. The vote, 56 to 41, marked bipartisan condemnation of the U.S. role in the war in Yemen, which has killed tens of thousands and now threatens to starve a whopping 14 million people. In a second voice vote, the Senate condemned the brutal murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi at the direction of the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Today's Yemen vote was also a strong statement against the unfettered power of American presidents, Democrat and Republican, to engage the U.S. military wherever they want, whenever they want. In fact, today was the first time since the War Powers Act was enacted in 1973 that either Chamber of Commerce has invoked it to end American involvement in a war. The War Powers Act was intended to reassert the constitutional primacy of Congress to declare war. This debate over the war in Yemen cannot move to the House because of a cowardly procedural move by Speaker Paul Ryan. He attached a rule to the Farm Bill, of all things, that would block a Yemen debate on the resolution. Congressman Ryan Costello, Republican of Pennsylvania, voted yes in the narrow vote to prevent House debate of the war in Yemen, and he joins me now. Congressman, you're one of 206 members of Congress to vote for the rule, which came up before the Farm Bill itself, that specifically had an item that said we won't consider the war powers resolution on Yemen. Why'd you vote yes? Didn't like the vote uh, in the respect that I don't think we should be combining... Uh, whether to proceed with a war powers resolution uh, in a farm bill. So the answer to your question is, number one, the farm bill needs to get passed. We've been working on it for way too long. We have issues of crop insurance, SNAP. Um, there's a lot in there that needs to get done. But let's fo- focus specifically uh, on the Yemen issue, which I and I think many others, even who voted f- uh, for the rule, uh, would like to make an affirmative position that we do need more clarity on what our involvement is in Yemen. At this point in time, my understanding is we're talking about intelligence gathering, refueling of Saudi um, uh, def- uh, planes. And the real constitutional question here is is that kind of assistance, does it give rise to military forces, uh, using the term hostilities under the War Powers right. Act? So I'm happy to talk to you more about that. Wait, but that, here's the, the problem, right? And I understand the sort of pragmatic calculation. We need the Farm Bill. There's a lot of stuff in there. I'm going right. to vote for the Farm Bill. So I vote for the rule. Leadership says vote for the rule. But in voting for the rule, and there were a lot of Republicans who defected, a, a surprising number um, who defected on the rule, you cut off the debate on it. I mean, it just seems to me so bizarre and disingenuous and sort of the opposite of uh, what you want in, in a vibrant democracy, which is just pass pass a rule that doesn't have this blockage and pass the farm bill. Agree. Totally bizarre. <laughs> I didn't like it. Moving forward, Chris, I want to try and be helpful to the discussion here. And the issue is going to be as follows. What we really actually need to do in Yemen in terms of getting more clarity and determine what our role is going to be, if any, is something that will probably fall outside the war powers resolution. So when a new and by the way, the president would have vetoed this anyway, and I'm not sure we get two thirds uh, in, in uh, the House and the Senate to do it. But but the real function here is a standalone bill because the ar- the constitutional argument is, and I think it's c- the correct one, is that what we actually need to uh, 
decide whether we're going to be involved or not falls outside the war powers resolution. That may we're be true. About- that may be yeah. true. I, I, I get that. And that right? was part of what that was part of my calculus. Again, I was asked to eat a sandwich, and it wasn't a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> right, if you but know that, what I'm okay. saying. And, and this look, this leadership does this all the time. It jams the members on rules. It was the reason they put it in. But it was striking to me to go out of. They went out of their way on this, right? Like I didn't understand that. I agree. That's with That's my question. Like what? What's so scary? If if you uh, think I, if, it, if if the president's going to veto it anyway, and to me, what here's I'll tell you what my theory is. I've been telling you what you think. I'm right. You're you're closer than I am to this. They don't want their members to take a vote on a war powers resolution in Yemen because it looks pretty bad that there's a bunch of kids starving and they're starving because of things that we're doing and facilitating. And Paul Ryan doesn't want a bunch of members to go in the house and say, well, this is why those kids have to starve. And so he saved Uh. everybody the trouble. I don't know that that's it, because because a couple of things. Listen, uh, I, it's a fair question. If we if we remove ourselves from the situation entirely, in other words, not a penny of aid, not yep. a penny of assistance, is are, is the situation better in Yemen? I'm not sure that it is. I, I, so, I think the so, odds are decent. All right. Uh, qu- question number two. I think it's less about putting us on the record because I think that vote was a not a. Not a vote that makes anybody happy. You're I saying the rule think that, vote, but people were pissed correct, about the rule vote. Correct. I think this is administration driven, and I think that the administration uh, that they probably does does not want to deal does not want to conflate what happened in Saudi Arabia Saudi Arabia with the murder of the journalist with what's happening in Yemen. And to be honest with you, I think for as horrific as that was and is, and for as much as we should question and seek justice, whether or not we provide assistance well, in Yemen because of the relationship with Iran to the Houthi rebels is that needs to be treated independently. And I'm not saying that all that, yes. well, as long as Saudi although Arabia is doing... That, I, I understand that argument, although I do think it's revealed something about the regime and how that regime may treat, say, civilian life, uh, given the way they treated the life of Jamal Khashoggi. Well, I agree with that. I agree Con- with that. Congressman yeah. Ryan Costello, thank you for making time tonight. Good to be with you. It is Friday. The 14th of December of 2018, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam, and our daily special is Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. Folks, we are all Nighthawks in the Diner of Life. Well, that being stated, I should mention that the French 77s, the most balanced cocktail in the history of cocktails, I might add, are uh, virtually being put together as we speak and will be ready in just a moment because we're going to need them. Oh boy, what a day and it's going to be another big weekend. It's Mueller Friday again. Who knows what's going to come down. And uh, boy... Uh, Trump had an unhinged uh, interview on one of the Fox shows, which uh, made me realize that if you add her all, there won't be any space left. Especially in his brain, there, there wasn't much space to begin with. Uh, it looks like it's, it's just a hollow piece of uh, bone, which it is. It's just that if there was a brain there, it wouldn't have, uh, you know, the capacity for, well, what we would call human thought. So, uh, the poor guy, you know, if he had been born just like a regular working stiff, he might have had to fend for himself and learn to get along with people. Now he's just, I don't know, he feels like he's a demagogue. That sounds like a speed freak uh, behavior. Man. (laughs) Man. The amount of people that are giving him sucker. I might also add that uh, I am batting 1,000. This is no brag. Okay, I'm not bragging. I'm not inflating it. But I have been batting 1,000 since, really, uh, when Nixon uh, was, was dicking around. Yeah, I'm talking about Tricky Dick Nixon dicking around in the Paris peace talks. And it was so obvious Everybody I knew thought that he was committing treason. And uh, we were only in junior high at the time. But I've been batting 1,000 on I told you so's since at least 1968. And uh, now it comes out that Lindsey Graham is being investigated for campaign finance violations and ties to Russians. I kept saying... 
how many rubles are in his campaign coffers when he started going off in the weird way that he went off. I made jokes about what kind of compromat he had on him. And I was immediately, I didn't even make any innuendo, by the way. I just mentioned what kind of compromat do they have on Lindsay? And immediately I was uh, besieged by, I don't know, 400 pound guys on their sofas in Macedonia. Uh, attacking me for being a homophobe. And I hadn't even mentioned anything about Lindsey Graham's uh, perceived proclivities. I just mentioned what kind of compromat they had on him. So, I'm just saying. I told you so. Batting 1,000 uh, since 1968. At least. So, uh, I keep I keep chalking them up I, I i'm almost wishing that i would be wrong sometime i just wish but uh i do wait around to see if i if if my uh, conjecture is confirmed because i'm not ever really certain i have uh you know some evidence backed uh speculation so shall we say like we all do <laughs> Oh, man. Hey, what else is in the news? There's a massive manhunt for two racists who attacked a, a black woman in a Walmart. Uh, police and news, local news said, for no apparent reason. Two white guys attacked a black woman in Walmart for no apparent reason. Well, I to me, I keep telling everybody the, the reason is rather apparent. They're racist. Why can't people just say that? Oh, I know, it has to be evidence-based, and all they have is two white guys yelling racial slurs at a black woman in Walmart and kicking the butt, kicking her in the, you know, in the butt and harassing her, assaulting her. That's all the evidence they have. They don't know whether they were raised in a racist household. They have to find that out first. <laughs> well, uh, one nice thing about being in the Internet is that we're really not... Uh, you know, held by those constraints. Some of us are, and it's good. I mean, we want corroborating evidence. I agree. But it uh, looks to me like they're racist. And I'm batting 1,000, and I told you so's. What else is on the rest of the menu today here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? Well, starting off at the top there, that was uh, the Senate Reportage on the Senate delivering an historic rebuke of Trump over the War Powers Act. This is the first time that the Senate has voted against the president in a military endeavor. Oh, oh but Paul Ryan had to attach a poison pill to the farm bill to prevent debate on funding Yemen incursions and others. And also making a statement about uh, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Paul Ryan cowardly put that in. Oh, but I must say, he did have help in that vote with five cowardly Democrats. Seventeen Republicans crossed the aisle. The farm bill would have been passed if the Democrats had held firm and voted against it because then they would have taken out the provision about the Yemen vote. But this is what you get when you have, uh, I don't know, some blue dogs. I think mean, that's who they were. Youngins, too. <laughs> the ones that want to take Pelosi out of their her leadership role. And you know how smart she is? <laughs> I just got to say. Um... She, in her great bargaining powers, convinced these uh, never Pelosi types that, okay, I'll put a term limit on the speakership to four years. And um, there you go. And they said, they said, yes. Okay. Well, in four years, uh, how old will Nancy be? And I think that uh, by that time, she'll have righted the ship enough that she feels confident that, you know, she can go spend time with her grandkids and great grandkids, by the way. I think they're coming along. 
She's put in a lifetime of service. And you don't kick her out when we need her the most. And I think that she's ready to retire. She's so smart. God, I love her. Okay, on the rest of the menu here, Ron DeSantis is slow walking restoration of Florida voting rights. The former Trump tax attorney raided by the FBI in Chicago last month that we uh, reported here. And the, I believe it was in the Bistro Cafe, West Coast Cookbook of Speakeasy. It was indeed. Well, guess what? He, he's raided by the FBI again. And federal prosecutors are, in, are investigating whether Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates funneled cash into the inauguration and a pro-Trump super PAC. They're talking about Russian money, but you know what? It's going to be a bunch of Middle Eastern money coming in here that's very dark and very evil. After the break, we move to the chef's table where Hungary nullified its independent judiciary, further cementing Orban's authoritarian grip. Sort of like what's happening here with the Federalist Society and and uh, packing the courts with federal, Federalist Society goons. And the number of U.S. inmates on death row has reached a 25-year low as fewer death sentences are handed down and death row inmates clear their names or die of natural causes. All that and more. On West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Bon Appetit. Bottom of our homepage at nutrootsradio.com. To the right of the page is the chat room link. Uh, please do, do feel free to check in. It is monitored by Kelly Lincoln, though she be a busy gal. Uh, she's rather diligent in the monitoring of that, and we'll get back to you uh, right away if she's not actually in the chat room when you're there. So check it out. Do also, when you're at the bottom of our homepage at netroosradio.com, take a gander <laughs> to the left of the page. The contribute button is there. And if you could please become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, your, your recurring do uh, contribution uh, goes a long way here. And uh, this is the season of giving. God, I hate that term. God. <laughs> but it, it it is what it is. And... Uh, uh, we are, I hate confessing this, but we are in dire need, and your help would be greatly appreciated. And those who have helped, thank you. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts for your generosity. I cannot express adequately how much it helps, and it does. So thank you. Follow Netroots Radio on Twitter at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that platform, and thank you, Tom. You could follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam, and I also post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime, and I am found there as Justice Putnam. You can follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West, and of course, we are on Twitter, all of us, I mean Twitter, we're all on uh, Facebook, and if you want to find us there, you can. Most importantly, though, for the show, you can get podcasts of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy by way of TuneIn, uh, Stitcher, Spreaker, uh, iTunes, YouTube, iHeart, and wherever fine podcasts can be found. Okay, it's Friday. I made it to Friday, and now, is it really rest time anymore? No. <laughs> But uh, at least we made it to the weekend. All right. This first article is out of 
think progress here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. Mm -hmm. That's right, folks. Now, we have the French 77s. That is the house special, and a special special it is indeed. And (laughs) usually specials are something they're trying to pawn off on you because they got a little bit too much of something. They need to get rid of it to get shelf space. Just saying. But here in uh, West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, uh, when we serve the French 77s, always top shelf. That's right. You're going to get the Saint Germain. You're not going to get some, you know, uh, knockoff. Not here. Well, Ron DeSantis somehow won the governorship of Florida. Somehow. And already, you know, he's busy at work trying to prevent people from voting. Isn't that funny? Well, he is trying to undermine one of the most momentous progressive wins of the midterm election after an estimated 1.4 million people had the right to vote restored when Amendment 4 passed last month. Nearly 65% of voters in the state approved the measure. The amendment itself was simple. People convicted of a felony would have their voting rights restored after completing their terms of sentences. The only exception would be for people convicted of murder or felony sexual assault. But DeSantis told the Palm Beach Post late Wednesday that the measure would not go into effect as envisioned by the 5.2 million Floridians who voted for it. First, he said, The state lawmakers should pass implementing language in a separate bill that would require his signature before going into effect. They don't know how to legislate, but they do know how to rule, don't they? Florida's legislator conveniently doesn't meet for two months after uh, an amendment for a scheduled implementation date, which is January 8th. Of next year. Oh, you mean like in less than a month. They're going to be able to do that in March. DeSantis said a passing implementation language. There's no way you can go through this session without implementing it. (laughs) He chuckled under his breath. I'm adding that part. Now, Howard Simon, the ACLU's former executive director who helped draft Amendment 4, told the Tampa Bay Times, that DeSantis is deliberately misreading the intent of the measure, which made national news as the biggest enfranchisement of voters in U.S. history since suffrage. Now, DeSantis' job is to facilitate the wishes of the voters, not frustrate and delay what the voters overwhelmingly called for, Howard Simon told the newspaper, the new language of our Constitution goes into effect on January 8th, and that becomes the highest law of the land. The governor does not have the right to set aside the Constitution. Now, of course, when you're in the Freedom Caucus, which is just a nice way of saying tea party or tea baggers. Remember when they were tea baggers and they found out what tea bagging really was? (laughs) <laughs> then they became Tea Partiers, Freedom Caucus, Brown Shirt, Nazi Stormtroopers. Come on. I'm telling you, I've been batting 1,000% and I told you so's. It's all part of a barrage of efforts to slow roll the implementation of the measure. Lisa McClanahan, Florida State Chair of Common Cause, a voter advocacy uh, group, told the Tampa Bay Times that the state appears to be putting in new barriers to vote. Do you think? Why did we have a constitutional amendment in the first place, she said, or asked. (laughs) The people took care of that by creating a self-implementing amendment, implementing amendment, and it's a curious situation, she said. In the weeks since the election, Florida election officials say they still have yet to receive any direction from the state on how to begin registering and returning citizens the label adopted by many people who have served their time after felony convictions. 
We did everything the proper way to make sure this was passed, Valencia Gunder, an activist and returning citizen, told Think Progress. Everything they told us to do, we did. And the fact that they're trying to stop us is ridiculous. I served my time. I should not continue to be punished. And that's the whole point. We're not supposed to be putting scarlet letters on people who have served their time. We need to move away from a society of retribution to really one of rehabilitation. Isn't that what makes America great in the first place? Noor al Sabai of Raw Story brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. Donald Trump's former Chicago tax attorney, Alderman Ed Burke, had his city hall office raided by the FBI yesterday, and it wasn't the first time he had an office searched by the Bureau. Well, Thursday evening, Burke City Hall office was re-raided by the Bureau, the second time his office has been raided in a month after the FBI searched it on November 29th. Well, on December 10th, the Chicago Sun-Times reported that the FBI had also seized Burke's cell phone. The same day, the newspaper also reported that the long-serving alderman's top political aide was questioned by the feds before the late November raid. Burke, who has been an alderman for almost 50 years did Trump's property taxes from 2006 until 2018. Oh, he was just uh, like a coffee boy. Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is another article out of Raw Story, this time by Bob Brigham. Federal prosecutors are investigating whether Middle Eastern countries funnel donations to a pro Trump super PAC and his inauguration in the hopes of buying influence over American policy. Well, of course, haven't they done this before? The inquiry focuses on whether people from Middle Eastern nations, including Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates, use straw donors to disguise their donations to the two funds. Now, federal law prohibits foreign contributions to federal campaigns, PACs, or those known as political action committees, and inaugural funds. The super PAC, Rebuilding America Now, was funneled by billionaire financier Tom Barrick Jr., a close friend of Trump, who also chaired the inauguration. Really? The super PAC, Rebuilding America Now, was formed in the summer of 2016, when Mr. Trump's presidential campaign was short of cash and out of favor with many major Republican donors. This is an article out of the New York Times, by the way, uh, because they, they'll refer to Trump as Mr. Trump instead of Donnie Two Scoops. While Trump insisted that he could finance his own campaign, he refused to dig too deeply into his own pockets, the Times explained. According to several of the people familiar with the investigation, Paul Manafort, 
who then headed the campaign, suggested that Mr. Barrick step into the void by creating and raising funds for the pack, which could raise unlimited amounts of money as long as it avoid coordinating closely with the candidate. Uh, the investigation appears to involve the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of New York and the Eastern District of New York. Southern District being in Manhattan, the Eastern District being in Brooklyn. All right, that brings us to our break period, and we will come back and go through weather from around the world and finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. This week, the Internet According to Disney. Years before Wreck-It Ralph, Walt Studio ventured into cyber world musings with the ambitious, abstract, and highly underrated Tron 2. With Ralph Breaks the Internet, the characters from Wreck-It leave the arcade, as they did in Tron after the first few scenes, to discover new worlds and, in this one, new things about each other. The story concerns Ralph and Vanellope, voiced again by John C. Riley and Sarah Silverman, respectively. If you didn't see the first, the two are video game characters. Vanellope's being from an obsolete, if charming, arcade racing game. When her pal Ralph is mostly responsible for breaking it, they decide to explore the new-to-them Internet, specifically eBay, to find the part to fix it. Being electronic entities themselves, they are actually in the Internet, and the movie's mostly a romp through it, with the challenges and opportunities like search engines, pop-ups, and online gaming being experienced by the characters in the first person. Penelope falls head over heels for a Grand Theft Auto-like game called Slaughter Race, which comes with a cast of characters, including the cooler-than-cool Shank, voiced by Gal Gadot. To raise funds for the part they need from eBay, Ralph experiences viral video stardom. But while he's doing everything to save the arcade game for his friend, it's clear that Penelope's interests are diverging. How Ralph's insecurity over this fact becomes manifest and then interacts with viruses may be one of the cooler creative excursions you've seen on a screen lately. Ralph Breaks the Internet combines a sophisticated look at an interpersonal relationship, a clever takedown of Internet culture, and some pretty hilarious inside Disney self-deprecation for a ride you won't want to miss. This has been Take-Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. Catch up with us at Take-TwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our page on YouTube. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. Hundreds of millions of years from now, when humans are probably long gone, what sort of geologic record will we leave behind for future archaeologists? Plastics? Sure. Concrete, maybe? How about... A tasty, tender chicken. Good chicken. Ooh, chicken. Yeah, chicken. Humanity consumes some 66 billion birds a year. That's billion with a B. The mass of chickens on the Earth is so big, it beats the mass of all other birds combined. The numbers are astonishing. Richard Thomas is an archaeologist at the University of Leicester who writes with his colleagues in the journal Royal Society Open Science that chicken bones could be a unique signifier of our era, known as the Anthropocene. Thomas says our chicken industrial complex can be traced back to a program in the late 1940s, known as the Chicken of Tomorrow program. Yes, indeed. Chickens and eggs are a big business. And like big business, there's a serious effort to improve the product. A three-year program to breed a better chicken is now being carried on. They came up with this fast-growing meat chicken. Then, in the decades to come, selective breeding, gene editing, antibiotics, and new types of feed and housing helped maximize chickens' weight gain even more. The chickens of today are something like four times heavier than the original broiler chickens of the 1950s. The upshot, he says, is these bigger bone broilers are huge compared to the wild red jungle fowl they're descended from. 
and modern chickens will stand out in the fossil record for their size and especially their ubiquity. We're going to find these huge middens, as we'd call them archaeologically, these huge rubbish heaps that are going to be filled with fossilized remains of chickens, and they're going to be the overwhelming animal species that we find. And that, folks, may be the foremost legacy that human greatness leaves behind. And all without solving one of the most enduring mysteries of all. After all these years, whether the chicken or the egg came first is still the subject of a lot of good-natured debate. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. This is an important message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. When it snows this winter, make sure you clear more than your driveway. Before you hit the road and before you get in the driver's seat, check to be sure that your vehicle's tailpipe is clear of snow. If the tailpipe is blocked, carbon monoxide, an odorless, colorless, and deadly gas produced by your engine, can build up quickly inside your vehicle, poisoning anyone inside. To learn more, call 1-800-CDC-INFO. That's 1-800-232-4636. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. For an expectant mother, taking care of her developing baby means taking good care of herself. One way she can do this is by ensuring she gets vaccinated. If a woman is or might be pregnant during flu season, it's especially important to get her annual flu shot, preferably before the end of October. In addition, women should be vaccinated against whooping cough during the third trimester of each pregnancy. Failure to get vaccinated places both mother and baby at increased risk for serious complications of these infections, including hospitalization and even death. If you're pregnant or planning to get pregnant, ask your health care provider when you should get your vaccines. Thank you for joining us on A Minute of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. It's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to NetrootsRadio.com? It's all we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution and you'll get a wondiferous pair of Netroots radio stickers for application to your backpack, your bumper sticker, or your banjo. Well, it's up to you which backpack you want to put it on. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetrootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. Should public schools teach science? I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. And that is a real question, with an answer that apparently had been eluding the Board of Education of the state of Arizona for quite some time. That's because the superintendent of public instruction, Diane Douglas, has been trying to have the public schools create a platform for creationism by having the science curriculum question and disparage the fact of evolution in the science curriculum. Douglas has said, quote, Personally, I absolutely believe that intelligent design should be taught alongside evolution. Douglas necessarily added to her statement, quote, Courts have deemed that unconstitutional. Fortunately, the Arizona State Board of Ed finally, in October, in a close 6-4 to vote, rejected Douglas's proposals 
and instead voted to restore references to evolution in the state's education standards on science. You might have thought that this fight about teaching evolution ended after Clarence Darrow's defense of John Thomas Scopes in Tennessee in 1925. But on that score, if you have believed that the fight to be able to teach science in America's schools had been won, sadly, you'd be wrong. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. I read the news today, oh boy. It's time for Nicole Sandler's What's News from NicoleSandler.com and the Progressive Voices Network. Donald Trump was in the room where it happens. In the room during an August 2015 meeting at which federal prosecutors believe a criminal scheme to violate campaign finance laws to help Trump win the presidency was discussed. Trump, his former fixer Michael Cohen, and David Pecker, the chairman of the parent company of the National Enquirer, talked about a plan to shield Trump from potentially damaging stories and pay hush money to women who claimed they'd had affairs with him. Prosecutors say this amounted to illegal donations to his 2016 campaign. NBC's Tom Winters has more. Back in August of this year, Michael Cohen pled guilty to a criminal information and it said that the first discussions of these kind of payments or this catch and kill involving American Media, the parent company of uh, the National Enquirer, and, and that company's CEO, David Pecker, Michael Cohen, and an unnamed other campaign official, those first discussions started back in August 2015, that if any stories came up about Donald Trump and women, that they would try to pay for those stories and then hold those stories so that nothing embarrassing came out about the president. And then yesterday we had this non-prosecution agreement that came out uh, involving AMI. And in there, there was a statement of the facts, essentially things that American Media Incorporated and federal prosecutors here in New York, the Southern District, things that they agree about. The Wall Street Journal reported back in November, and NBC News has now confirmed that, in fact, the, the other campaign official in the room is the guy at the head of the campaign himself, Donald Trump. Federal prosecutors are investigating Trump's inauguration committee for possible misspending of donations. The Manhattan U.S. Attorney's Office is reportedly looking into the record $107 million raised for the inauguration, including whether the committee's biggest donors gave money in exchange for access to Trump and whether the committee collected illegal foreign contributions. The Wall Street Journal's Rebecca Davis O'Brien spoke with CNN's Jake Tapper. What we've reported is that the um, investigation is still in its early stage but some people have been asked questions about their donations and about the committee's spending. Obviously, there was a huge amount of money involved here, more than has ever been recorded in the um, inaugural fund. Um, and there have been questions swirling around this committee and how it spent its money and the sort of um, outsized costs. Um, involved for months now. And uh, this just shows that some of the materials that were seized in the Michael Cohen raids earlier this year could play a role in other investigations. Michael Cohen, Trump's former personal attorney and fixer, who was this week sentenced to serve three years in jail, sat down for an interview Friday morning with ABC's George Stephanopoulos. Nothing at the Trump organization was ever done unless it was run through Mr. Trump. He directed me, as I said in my allocution, he directed me to make the payments. He directed me to become involved in these matters, uh, including the one with McDougal, which was really between him and David Pecker, and then David Pecker's counsel. I just reviewed the documents in order to protect him. I gave loyalty to someone who truthfully does not deserve loyalty. He was trying to hide what you were doing, correct? Correct. And he knew it was wrong? Of course. And he was doing that to help his election? You have to remember at what point in time that this matter came about two weeks or so before the election, post the Billy Bush comments. So yes, he was very concerned about how this would affect the election. Joint resolution supporting a diplomatic solution in Yemen and condemning the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Eyes appear to have it. The eyes do have it. Joint resolution is passed. In a major rebuke to Donald Trump, the Senate passed a resolution unanimously condemning Saudi Arabia's crown prince for the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. The Senate also passed a resolution voting 56 to 41 to end U.S. military support for the Saudi-led war in Yemen, which has pushed millions of civilians to the brink of starvation. 
Maria Butina pleaded guilty Thursday to conspiring with a senior Russian official to infiltrate the conservative movement in the United States as an agent for the Kremlin from 2015 until her arrest in July. This makes Butina the first Russian national convicted of seeking to influence U.S. policy in the run-up to the 2016 election by acting as a foreign agent. She agreed to cooperate in a plea deal with U.S. investigators in exchange for less prison time. A seven-year-old girl from Guatemala died of dehydration and shock after she was taken into Border Patrol custody last week for crossing from Mexico into the United States illegally with her father and a group of migrants. The girl and her father were taken into custody December 6th as part of a group of 163 people who approached U.S. agents to turn themselves in. More than eight hours later, the child began having seizures. Emergency responders measured her body temperature at 105.7 degrees, and according to a statement from CBP, she reportedly had not eaten or consumed water for several days. And finally, the window to purchase health insurance via the Affordable Care Act for 2019 coverage closes Saturday, December 15th at 12 midnight. The Trump administration's slashing of the budget for advertising and enrollment outreach seems to have worked. So far, the number of people signing up through healthcare.gov, the main enrollment portal, is down about 12 percent from the same time last year. And last year was down slightly from the year before that. If you don't get insurance through your employer, check out the exchange at healthcare.gov, but do it before Saturday night at midnight. I got the news. And that's a bit of what's news for now. I'm Nicole Sandler. If you appreciate these reports and the Nicole Sandler show, I hope you'll consider making a contribution. My work is 100% listener supported and I can't do it without your help. Find out more at NicoleSandler.com slash donate. From Washington, I'm Luke Vargas with your World in Two Minutes. National Security Advisor John Bolton unveiled a new U.S.-Africa policy on Thursday, pledging to promote U.S. trade interests, fight terrorism, and reduce foreign aid. But central to the new strategy is the threat of growing Chinese and Russian influence. The U.S. accuses China of lending large sums to African countries with a goal of seizing state assets when those countries fall short on loan payments. China uses bribes, opaque agreements, and the strategic use of debt to hold states in Africa captive to Beijing's wishes and demands. Its investment ventures are riddled with corruption and do not meet the same environmental or ethical standards as U.S. developmental programs. As an alternative, Bolton touted a new Prosper Africa program to highlight less compromising U.S. investments. And in framing it as a counter to China's influence, in some ways talks down to African governments and African citizens. Jennifer G. Cook directs the Institute for African Studies at George Washington University. We want you to be independent. We want you to grow self-sufficient. And you need to be very careful about China, which is deepening your debt. That's not the language of a partnership of mutual respect. Optics aside, countering Russian and Chinese influence won't be cheap, and Bolton instead pressed for reducing foreign aid to countries able to pay their own bills or that vote against the U.S. at the United Nations. Todd Moss is a senior fellow at the Center for Global Development. Africa is a long-term strategic play for the United States, and we should behave like we're here for the long haul rather than negotiating over small things over short-time horizons. Regardless of the wisdom of a focus on short-term costs, the White House may not have the final say. Bipartisan members of Congress killed a White House effort to reduce foreign aid by $3 billion earlier this year. Luke Vargas, Washington. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. We are all Nighthawks in the Diner of Life. Oh, uh, please imbibe with the French 77s. Uh, the They are there uh, to accompany the Homo's Bouche, which will uh, begin shortly after we go through weather from around the world. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast 
of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 27 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, brr! But we're looking forward to much warmer daytime temperatures. We're expected to go to about 51. And that is because of some warm air mass bringing uh, precipitous amounts of moisture is headed our way. Right now, the winds are out of the north-northeast, uh, light and variable, less than one mile per hour, by the way. But in just an hour to two, <clears throat> the winds will then shift out of the south-southwest at 20 to 30 miles per hour, which puts us right now in an active wind advisory. And those are steady winds at 10, 20 to 30 miles per hour, with gusts maybe topping 60 to 70 miles per hour at some peaks and some pinched valleys. Ooh. As well as uh, the wind, uh, we're going to have a lot of rain. Looks like we're going to have almost a quarter inch. And then uh, we'll taper off a bit tonight and then pick up again tomorrow and expect it to dump about a half an inch. In the late uh, afternoon, early evening, and then overnight. So, uh, wow, we got some rain, and uh, looks like overnight lows will be in the mid to upper 30s. And uh, that's where that is. Let's see. Okay, so rain coming in, big amount. Uh, that pollen must be all washed down onto the ground because the weather underground has it rated as none. Right now, the air quality index is moderate at 78, though I should add, overnight it was in the danger level for people, even with people who are, you know, don't have any problems with their lungs. It was topping out at almost 200 parts per million. And I suppose that's because people were burning wood to keep warm and uh, the smoke was held close to the ground. Uh, but it's still not healthy for those uh, who have breathing problems. Though the wintertime, or soon-to-be winter, uh, daytime UV index is rated low at 1. Barometric pressure is falling at 29.76. Visibility is coming down to 8 miles. And relative humidity is at 78%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. Oh, uh, that's my P-tape. Just so you know. London is 38 and partly cloudy. Paris is 35 degrees and cloudy. Rome is 45 degrees and mostly cloudy with a disruption due to heavy amounts of rain. Kiev is 30 degrees with a light snow. Oh, Kabul is 33 and clear, and that means weather, wedding parties, stay inside. You're still not safe from the drones even inside, but you're in more danger parading in a joyous manner outside. Just as a warning, we've been there before. Hong Kong is 59 and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 42 and mostly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 75 and mostly cloudy. San Francisco, California, surprisingly, is 53 and mostly cloudy. But you know what? They have a gale warning. So hold on to your hats there. And New York, New York, is a very temperate 48 degrees Fahrenheit and cloudy. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. Barnes 
Minds of Think Progress brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. Oh, my God. Hungry nullifies the independent judiciary. And these new reforms would make it all but impossible to prosecute Orban or anyone in his party. And I think this is a Petri dish for uh, what a uh, certain, I don't know, uh, madman in the Oval Office might be considering. You take your pick if that's Trump or Stephen Miller. Uh, it's up to you. Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban took another step closer to becoming Europe's premier autocrat by passing a law that effectively nullifies the country's ju- independent judiciary. Under the new legislation, which passed through the Hungarian parliament on Wednesday, the country's Supreme Court is now stripped of its ability to judge what are known as administrative disputes. Oh, you mean process crimes. In Hungary, this is a wide-ranging description encompassing anything from electoral law to corruption to police abuse to tax evasion. Oh, you mean process crimes. Instead, a new system will be set up over the next 12 months, overseen by Orban's justice minister, who will control which judges get promoted to settle the administrative disputes. Oh, you mean the process crimes. Hungary's existing independent judiciary would be significantly weakened and have no oversight of the new system. Maybe they can call the new one the People's Court. Yeah, and have a guy by the name of Friedlander. Maybe they can put on a Friedlander wig. The move to quash the independence of the judiciary is the latest autocratic move by Orban, who is feeling increasingly emboldened as the beleaguered EU confronts political threats on all sides, be it from Brexit, the Yellow Vests, or the rise of far-right parties like the AFD in Germany. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers C'est tout Gabriella Border of Reuters brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Blue Moon Spirits Fridays, the number of U.S. inmates executed this year, has reached a 25-year low as fewer death sentences are handed down. Death row inmates clear their names or die of natural causes. Fewer then 2,500 inmates are awaiting execution as 2018 draws to an end after 25 executions, marking this the third consecutive year with fewer than 30 executions. Well, that is by the DPIC, the Depart- Death Penalty Information Center, a nonprofit organization that collects data on the death penalty in the U.S., Public appetite for the death penalty has declined dramatically since the 90s. And uh, that was Robert Dunham, executive director of the DPIC. The death penalty has been criticized for years because of its arbitrariness, because of its racial disparities, because of its disproportionately, uh, because it disproportionately sentences people to death who are poor, who are defenders of color, or who have mental illness or intellectual disabilities. I always say that's not, that's not a bug that's a feature all right that brings us to the end of our broadcast period but netroots radio broadcasts on all day and through the weekend so we'll meet up with you on monday for river city hash monday so stay tuned to netroots radio all day all night all weekend for all the news as it breaks and we will meet up right here on monday in west coast cookbook and speakeasy boom petite
Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des TF Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coer Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 